well, good morning, good day, and good afternoon to all of you, wherever you may be. Um, as usual, I'd like to remind everyone that if you could not make it to this week's uh, Market Movers, we record these sessions and they're available on our YouTube channel, um, usually a day after. And you're always welcome to sign up on all our socials, you know, Twitter, YouTube, uh, and others in order to catch up on the latest crypto and DAP news. In this week's uh, Market Movers, we'll be discussing the bear markets in traditional finance and crypto, how both of those performed, and where do we go from here in uh, the near future. Together with me is one of our writers, uh, Charlie Butler. Hello, Charlie. Introduce yourself to the public. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see so many faces. Always enjoy a live audience. That's a bit of a excitement to a recording. So very happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Wonderful. So um, let's get uh, down to brass tacks. Uh, the overall, it's, there's no denying that the bear markets have hit all the industries and they're all hit pretty hard. Um, in our initial overview, we're going to look at how the bear markets have affected different strata of the traditional financing, including bonds, stocks, um, commodities. Uh, we're going to compare that how the crypto um, uh, horizons have been affected, including DeFi, NFTs, and games. and we're going to compare and contrast the two and discuss where do we go from here. At the end, we're going to invite members of the audience if they have any questions or particular insights. So without further ado, how the traditional markets have been affected. If you've been following the news, you have probably heard that the Fed has raised the rates by 75 points. And the markets, if you're paying attention right now, the uh, the markets have been open since one hour or so, and they've been reacting fairly poorly. Uh, both Nasdaq, Dow, and the S and P are both down by about four percent. Which is there any is... Game of Thrones fans out? Quickly, boys, just for any Game of Thrones fans out there, yeah. it looks a bit like the Red Wedding at the moment. Yeah, so it's it's fairly bad. Why why is such a visceral reaction? Well, for the most things, is that. Uh, the economy is mostly predicated on having cheap loans and a lot of the companies can finance, uh, restructure and procure uh, new hardware, software, whatever it is that they need with cheap loans. Fortunately, that is not going to be the point. The other big issue that's looming over us, like the sword of Damocles, is that unfortunately, one of the biggest economies in the world today, which is the American economy, it's 31 trillion in debt. Um, as of today, and unfortunately, any increase in uh, basis points, as such a one one percent increase in basis points, is a, effectively a thirty billion increase in uh, payments that the U.S. has to repay. Um, unfortunately, that is due to the effects of COVID and the severe contraction of the economy. Um, it's just not feasible to pay back these loans in any uh realistic time frame so the question is that what do we do if we do not raise rates well unfortunately the inflation is as standing as of today is 8.6 percent and any loans and any debts that you had are essentially going to be eaten away by the inflation and because the u.s economy essentially printed 80 percent of all the circulating money just to put it into perspective in um, winter of 2019 or uh, the spring of 2020, there was around $4 trillion in circulation around the world. By spring 2022, we have 20 trillion. Uh, so essentially five times as many as there were in the economy. What happened, as you all know, a lot of the economies got closed during COVID. Uh, a lot of industries were essentially put on hold. If you were in the tourist industry, if you were in the catering and the restaurant business, um, essentially you couldn't serve any customers and people couldn't spend a lot of the money that was infused into the economy on a lot of things that they used to be able to buy. People couldn't travel anywhere, they couldn't go to the pub, they couldn't enjoy a lot of things that they used to. So naturally, a lot of people started investing all that money and putting it in stocks. Um, 
putting it into the crypto markets as well. We saw Bitcoin rise to 67,000, uh, buying all sorts of altcoins. And we also had our summer of um, NFTs where a lot of people were in, uh, sorry, last year in July was the highest recorded transactions for NFTs. And essentially came down to a lot of people having loose money uh, that got artificially pumped into the economies and people started buying stuff that they normally wouldn't be able to. So unfortunately, chickens have uh, come home to roost and we are essentially feeling the effects of it. Um, traditionally, as well, uh, at least the, the common knowledge is that stocks are a hedge against the inflation. And the conventional wisdom is that you know, if uh, you buy a stock and everything is getting more pricey, then the stocks are also going to be increased in value proportional to the inflation, and that's going to hedge against it. Unfortunately, as we see, it's not the case because a lot of the companies, they also have their overheads to keep. They have to keep paying their employees. They have to be paying the rents. They have to pay for electricity and everything else. And a lot, but they're not ger generating the revenues to coincide with that. So unfortunately, it coincides with layoffs. It means that a lot of things uh, that they have to keep increasing their costs, whether it be Netflix increasing their monthly subscriptions, whether it be other companies increasing the license fees, and it affects on the people who cannot afford that anymore and they choose to unsubscribe. Overall, the, the stock market has been hit also pretty severely. The NASDAQ to this day is uh, down by 23%. Uh, sorry, um, the S&P is down by 23%. The NASDAQ, which is uh, mostly uh, tech stocks and is closely correlated with crypto as well, it's down by 32%. And Dow Jones, which is the... Um, average of uh, various companies in the U.S. that represent the U.S. economy as a whole is down by 18%. Now, if you were there during the uh, initial boom uh, in 2020, and you could also argue in 20, uh, starting from 2017 onwards, so-called FANG stocks, which were uh, Facebook, Amazon, um, oh, Facebook at the time, now it's Meta, uh, Netflix, and PayPal, a lot of those companies so uh, an insane boost uh, to the economy as we've been going from 2018 to uh, 2021. And unfortunately, a lot of those companies have uh, felt the brunt of the recession with companies like Netflix is down by 74% from its highs. Google is down by 26%, Amazon by 43%, PayPal by 75%, and Facebook by 48%. So uh, a lot of the stock market has been severely hit. And if, yes, uh, Charlie previously mentioned the uh, uh, entire uh, horizon of the stock market right now is pretty much already red, save for one or two small companies that are trading in the slight green as of today. Um, moreover, and the traditional safe havens, which were cyclical stocks such as uh, retail or restaurant businesses, they are also down. Um, metals and commodities are also down. Gold is down uh, by 12% since the beginning of the year, and copper is also down by nearly 20% in the beginning of the year. Of course, the biggest indicator of a uh, receding economy is oil. Oil is uh, uh, right now $120 a barrel, which very much reminds us uh, of what we had back in uh, 2008 when uh, uh, Brent oil was $140 a barrel. Now, while I'm telling you this, this you, know, you can get this news from your traditional uh, financial news. What, what I think is important is to contrast it to what happens in the crypto world. Um, but before I said that, Charlie, would you like to add anything or contrast it to anything that I've said so far? No, I think you've covered most of it there. Um, I was just going to, yeah, I mean, I think you've covered everything that you want to talk about in terms of CloudFi and the sort of problems that are going on there. I think it's fairly obvious, even to people who aren't interested in the, in, um, in the actual finance on a day-to-day -day basis, that things are getting more expensive, people are jittery. Governments are wondering what they can do to solve things. And as you said earlier about 
um, increase, increasing uh, interest rates. It's, if they don't do it, they're damned. And if they do do it, they're damned. So it seems like at the moment, um, people are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But I guess that's what happens when you shut down the world's economy for 18 months and then just pump loads of artificial cash into it at some point at, um, in time. So the shit's going to have to hit the fan, isn't it? Yeah. So in, in contrast, how did it affect the crypto economy? Uh, unfortunately, we, as mentioned previously, um, crypto, as we've seen, it's not a separate economy, but intrinsically uh, interwoven with the world economy. And um, because a lot of money got pumped into, um, well, essentially in forms of checks and, and government grants and stipends and whatnot, a lot of people decided to spend it also on crypto. That's why a lot of people bought Bitcoin, which propelled it to nearly 70,000. Uh, people bought Solana, people bought Ethereum, people bought everything. And yeah. the crypto economy rose to unprecedented heights. Naturally, since then, we've seen a pullback in overall trading. So DeFi has been probably hit the worst as we saw a complete erasure of um, $40 billion in the form of uh, Terra Luna, which essentially just uh, the whole blockchain just got axed. Um, just, just for comparison, if you at one point at the height of it invested $100,000 into Terra Luna, uh, you'd essentially, after the first plunge, you'd be less w left with just over $2,000. And by this point, you'd essentially be left penniless. Um, and with um, other blockchains, it's been uh, a much better story. Ethereum contracted by uh, 30%. Many of the similar blockchains uh, had similar performance. And unfortunately, if I remember correctly, the uh, uh, Tron was the only a uh, blockchain that got spared and actually had an increase um, in trading. Um, going over to NFTs, NFTs, sorry, I just uh, had a bit of a connection issue there. So yeah, going into NFTs, unfortunately, uh, NFTs, when we look over the uh, months over months trading, unfortunately, it's been a significant reduction there because we're essentially double dipping into the recession. On one hand, we had a reduction in um, overall trading in ETH, but also because ETH depreciated in value, people saw a reduction of uh, a double reduction of their buying potential there. And um, of, we saw a overall trading volume reduction over 20%. We a lot of blue chip. Uh, NFTs, unfortunately, also felt the brunt. We saw collections like um, Basie, essentially, uh, whose floor price dropped by 38%. Uh, we saw Azuki drop down uh, a reduction in floor price by 61%. And we saw Doodles drop down by 47%. And, of course, the uh, biggest elephant in the room in that case would be Bitcoin. That um, dropped down by 68% from its height and continues plummeting. So what, what does this essentially mean? Uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, took the gamble on Bitcoin where uh, it was traditionally believed also that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation. It's a hedge against the receding market and for the longest time was uh, touted as digital gold. Essentially, when everything goes south, you could always buy some Bitcoin and it's, it's going to help you in those hard times. Unfortunately, not even gold itself was spared, but it goes doubly so for Bitcoin. Now, don't want to, uh, like, I, I sincerely uh, feel sorry for the um, uh, CEO of MicroStrategy. I, sorry, so Michael Sader. Yeah. yeah, Michael Sader, sorry. I keep, keep forgetting his name, keep slipping me. Yeah, unfortunately, he's the biggest bull for Bitcoin. And I remember the, the one uh, interview where he said, I, I wish I could uh, invent the time machine or something along those lines where I would have more time to buy more Bitcoin. And, um, and also countries like El Salvador, who uh, essentially staked their whole economy on the price of Bitcoin, 
and unfortunately are suffering the brunt of this. Just uh, quickly, oh, Boris, I think yeah. we should really note at this point that they're looking in five to ten year time frames. They're not looking at what's happening in the next month or so. So, you know, they've they've kind of I think Michael Taylor has even said that he's sort of he's calculated and planned for dips and recessions and these these sort of things. But I think he's a long term bull as opposed to a kind of make a quick buck of it in a year. I'm sure Absolutely. that you, Yeah. Actually, you bring up uh, a very salient point. Absolutely. So um, as the, the biggest thing in, in stocks, whenever you buy at a loss uh, or when, when everything is collapsing, people are saying that, hey, you only lose if you sell. And that goes doubly so. If you remember or, or if you were there, if you were investing early on in the spring of 2020, we essentially had an even more severe correction. Uh, but that was a flash one where COVID just started and the uh, S&P dropped by over 30, I think it dropped by 35%. NASDAQ almost dropped by 40% and people were saying this is the end of the world as we know it. But lo and behold, literally just a couple of months later, not only did we recover, but we went to the unprecedented heights. Of course, this is a lot of it is due to artificial pumping of the um, uh, the numbers of the economy, but if you look at the overall graph of how the um, the stocks are performing right now, we're essentially slightly above to pre-COVID levels, which a lot of people would argue is the natural state of the economy, where uh, you know some some people were losers out of the COVID crisis, some people were winners, but overall our economy didn't shrink, but it just evolved into be something different a lot of the fat got trimmed a lot of the things we didn't need before got sold or died out a lot of new emerging uh technologies have um came on the market and overall we are i would i would say we're in a better place than we were two years ago so naturally yes the crypto market also suffered uh terrible losses but what, what does it say for bitcoin Personally, I think it, uh, and this is my subjective view, this is not financial advice, again, for, for all of this, this is just, uh, yeah, it needs to be said, actually, yes, this is not financial advice, but we're, we're, we are trying to uh, just give you all the facts and we encourage you to do your own due diligence and come to your own conclusions. Um, but uh, subjectively saying that uh, what this, uh, recession essentially is is a wake wake up call for a lot of the uh, extraneous and artificial companies that we have that that have been created and the companies and businesses that are essentially going to weather the storm are going to be here for the long haul. If I, I could compare it, it's akin to any of you who who are old enough to remember. This is akin to the dot com boom in the early 2000s, where essentially, you, you know, all the websites when the internet became the rage, everybody started making websites. What did they sell? What was the value proposition? People didn't care. Let's just you know throw money at whatever it is that that, that uh, is doing anything digitally, and hopefully that's going to create revenue. You know, for a time that worked, but then when the bubble burst. Probably, I would say 90% of the companies got uh, wiped from the face. But then from there, we got companies like Netflix, we got Google, we got Amazon, we got plenty of other companies. And those are the ones that weathered the storm because they, they actually had a value proposition. So I would say the same thing as what we're seeing now is that a lot of companies that uh, can weather the storm this time are essentially have a realistic value proposition. They have a user base and uh, are creating value for the customers and they're going to be here to stay until we eventually recover. Because I think we will eventually recover despite the uh, recession and despite the headwinds coming from the uh, no, geopolitical crisis that's happening in Europe right now. Is uh, There is unfortunately no way talking around it that w th there is a war going on and unfortunately it's affecting a the price of gas and heating and energy for a lot of people, which is again driving a lot of the services, because you know, in order to make cars, you need you need to have energy in order to uh, have uh, computers and create services for people. You need cheap electricity, so that's 
course, putting on the costs and everything. And because uh, two of the biggest wheat producers, producers of fertilizers, are partially at war with each other, that's also increasing the price of food for a lot of people. Hello, Boris, I think we've got someone for, with a question here. Oh. I, it's me, guys. Sorry to, uh, to gate crash your party. But I do actually have a question for you, Boris, and I wanted to ask. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool, man. So I'm just listening to the chat, and obviously... Um, I'm thinking from a trading perspective, I'm not looking for financial advice, obviously, but in a recession market, usually the products and services in the traditional markets that perform well are necessity services and low value services. Things like the pound shop actually do really well because people are value hunting and, and people's incomes are down slightly. So they're looking for value. But that's what's happening. That's where people tend to place their money in TradFi. Like that's where I would go to things like Netflix and, and services that will be popular for people who now want to stay at home. So in the world of crypto, where should we be looking, Boris? And in what sort of services and, and kind of features and products should, we be look, should people be looking for and researching right now based on the fact that you know, we're looking at the we're, we're sort of trying to find the long term winners here and figure out who's going to be around in a few years? How does it work in, in and, and that leads me to dApps. So obviously the dApps are the ones that we're looking at. So can you give me a bit of information there, Boris? Uh, actually, I wanted to, uh, in this way, segue into the um, new dApp report that I recently did. Uh, because a lot of, as you said, a lot of people are looking for a new value and new ways of generating that value. Well, I think one of the things that's um, not known to a lot, actually wasn't known to me, is uh, traditional art. Uh, a lot of people invest money into traditional art. Um, they purchase it, then after a couple of years, that painting appreciates and they sell it to uh, the next bidder. That, that's been the game for so long. What essentially, what I covered recently is the golden mint pass. And what they are essentially doing is that for they're creating value for people who are trying to diversify their investment finances, but they don't necessarily have the know-how how to invest in art because it, well, it needs a lot of arcane knowledge. Not a lot of people are classically trained to understand what, what would appreciate and what wouldn't. So essentially, holders of this mint pass, it works two ways, both for burgeoning artists and for collectors slash investors alike, is that you essentially you gain access to this platform and it's staffed by experts in their, all their respective fields, whether it be art, um, finances, Web3 development. And if you're an artist, what you essentially, they help you leverage your artistic skills into um, NFTs and Web3 in order that that's congruent with your creative process and that also you get a fair value for your art. Now, how does that relate to uh, potential investors and people who are looking for value? Well, if you don't pertain the specialized knowledge needed to invest in fine art, you essentially are, are uh, curate, you receive curated collections that are guaranteed to appreciate in value. Well, I think guaranteed as much as anybody could give any guarantee, but it's done by professionals who have been doing this for over 30 years. And on top of that, you also get the best picks of the juiciest bits of every collection, which is essentially going to be the best NFTs that you could potentially get in the near future, which I think is it's a very interesting way. You mean like sort of ETFs, like bundling up packages? Is that what you're referring to there? Sorry. Uh, Actually, it started quite recently as well. So what uh, a lot of, like, we all know that uh, you can shard NFTs. So imagine if you could shard not NFTs, but traditional art. That's, that's the best way that I would okay, explain right. it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So shared ownership. You can just buy a share in one piece of art, and if that whole piece of art goes up in value, then you yeah. get an extra percentage on your investment. What about in a more simplistic term, though, Boris, like in terms of categories of dApps, you know, um, we seeing gaming is popping still, despite the red all over the charts for tokens. Um, what do you think about that? Like what sort of categories are, are, are interesting right now in the dApp world? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Gaming is probably one of the uh, uh, one of the main things that is sidestepping the uh, the overall 
bear market in the sense that um, a lot of just recently we had Dapper Labs had, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, they had around 725 million invested into them to expand the flow chain and uh, uh, create more games and then ex expand the uh, various offerings there. Um, we see, uh, uh, yeah, as I said, I was just, just quickly looked it up. Yeah, it's 725 million uh, yeah. to expand the flow ecosystem. Um, I think on a more basic level as well, there's things like Alien Worlds, Axie Infinity, Splinterlands, Farmer's World. If you look at all of these games, they're still pulling in loads and loads of users. The so people obviously still want to play these games and they've still got a huge community um, and people who actually want to get involved, um, and they're actually growing as well. So, and if you, but if you look at then at their coin prices, some of them are down by ninety five percent because everyone's thinking, right? How do I make my? How do I get more liquid cash? How do I get away from risky assets? How do I get away from cryptocurrencies? Basically, because everyone's getting a bit scared. If you assume that these products, things like Alien Worlds and Axie Infinity, are going to have a community that keeps following them and keeps playing their games. Um, and then adds utility to their coins. At some point, those coin values will go up. So I think if you look at cheap barriers to entry, I think gaming coins are quite a good one. Ian, in answer to your question, just because it's obviously still quite popular. It's just that people have cashed them out at the moment just because they're scared of holding them. So I yeah, think sure. that, um, following good projects, necessarily not trying to follow the money at the moment, I think is quite a good tactic. Um, so yeah, do your research and basically look at what people are interested in, not what is hyped and what which things are going up by massive percentages yeah, good advice man and arguably playing games right now as you rightly just said token prices are down you can accumulate 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 and then when things are better again you'll be looking pretty good i would imagine so and you get to play right. games as well some of them are quite fun yeah that's it all right nice one boys thank you for that sorry to gate crash but i had some questions i'll see you yeah, no year. worries no worries uh so what do we oh yeah um so going back to the DAP that uh, I would, uh, Ian, Ian uh, naturally segued into me, but yeah, um, one of the more interesting, and because, because everything is essentially down at this point, one of the more uh, people are looking for alternative means of investment. And uh, fine art is some of the things that uh, people are very interested in, and, and in some cases, uh, by according to uh bloomberg and um uh, the website that that purveys uh sharding of fine art which i found in my own research called masterworks according to them um it has a um, annual uh rentability of 13 percent uh including the recession and everything so that's quite a bold statement but the idea of potentially investing into a fine art piece and that's that's professionally curated to you uh, by professionals, I think it's a very interesting value uh, proposition. And uh, so far, at least go the mint pass, it's only limited to 1000 passes. And you can be both an artist and a collector at the same time. Uh, what if this proves to be a very successful venture and by the uh, like judging by the caliber of the people that are behind this project, I mean, um, uh, they have people like Pharrell, like Cause. They, um, I remember one of their, uh, let me look at the that report quickly. Um, I, I remember one of their um, curators uh, owns a personal gallery and has been uh, curating art for over 25 years. So there are honestly a lot of very well-prepared people behind the project and they're, they're experts in their field and experts in the craft. So um, honestly, I, I am rooting for them to present such an interesting uh, value proposition for people in the near future. Hopefully it goes well for them. And if it does, if the idea catches on, maybe we'll see actually something similar happen uh, with the other projects, maybe it'll be a new way of doing NFTs where it's essentially, well, I know we can shard NFTs at this point in time, but uh, perhaps maybe we can start fusing more, like fusing the traditional and you know more tangible world with Web3. And essentially, because what I think a lot of people and the biggest argument against crypto is just, oh, it's all just 
digits bleep bloops all up in the air. But if we start tying it to things that are, uh, yeah, people can hold you that. Yeah, touchable and holdable. For example, um, I know what, one of the things that's um, at least that I was getting into is tokenization of real estate. So that you know you could before you know all buy an NFT which represents a fraction of a real estate, and that way you can own it that way. But these sound like things that are maybe some way off in the future. Um, yeah, I guess what are the sort of potential hedges um, against short-term losses or things to look for at the moment in? Um, with potential short-term gains or to stop stop the rot. Um, have you got any yeah. ideas on sort of stuff that already exists that is more short-term? Well, I see the, um, just quickly, I want to go over like the, the contrasting because we, we said what's everything is bad in, in, uh, in the traditional finance, how the, well, not what's bad, but how negatively the traditional finance was affected, how, Crypto was affected. I want to talk about the positives, and then I, I think we could talk about where do we go from there. I mean, yeah. the positive is that um, if you look at actual uh, months to months trading in NFTs uh, in ETH specifically, uh, we're actually on par. Uh, we only decreased by six point five percent months over months, which is uh, actually you know not that much of a reduction because. Overall, things got cheaper, so so people were incentivized to how uh, buy buy or buy into collections that or, or into uh, investment vehicles that previously previously were unavailable to them. Um, likewise, we still have many stellar collections that are getting released week over week um, in NFTs. Uh, just uh, in these couple of months, despite the uh, you know bear market, we had Goblin Town that's massively successful. We had Moonburst that came out that was massively successful. We um, uh, we had OK Bears and a lot of the collections. You know they they are forcing to adapt and uh, create something new and unique. Like for example, Goblin Town, they just completely flipped the script on all the traditional ways of doing uh, an NFT project, and it seems to be doing going very well for them. Um, likewise, I would also personally argue that because a lot of the established collections are uh, reaching critical mass, like there, there is very hard for them to go in there at a the price point where the next person buying in just essentially doesn't have the capital to do so. With the, and because they've been there for, for such a long time. I think the new and up and coming collections are essentially um, are acting as value transfer. So people would be selling their bases or, or crypto punks and whatnot to buy into um, Goblin Town because they're essentially they, they're a small collection. Well, no, they're a younger collection, got more room to grow. Likewise, we see that a lot of businesses that are shrinking and um essentially going laying people off or going to hiring freezes by contrast a lot of crypto uh businesses are thriving and hiring a lot of um well uh i know it's been mentioned that that coinbase is not having a good day but then again coinbase also not to disparage them or anything but uh their stock essentially got also extremely overinflated because uh they went uh they they had the uh, IPO at the time when we had a massive cash injection into the the stock market. And essentially, people were buying everything that uh, what there is to buy. So, um, arguably, I would say that despite the fact that things are tough all over, the traditional finances are the things that that supposed to safeguard against traditional uh collapses and look out for the little guy they 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 are the places that are supposed to be relatively safe and that regardless of what people do is that they invest and they that their money is relatively safe i mean after all a lot of uh, sovereign funds uh, a lot of pension funds and a lot of traditional money market people that are invested into 
these markets. This essentially have people's future on the line. And unfortunately, as this goes doubly so for a lot of people in the US, a lot of their savings just went up in smoke. I mean, if anybody had uh, money invested in, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, PayPal, or whatnot, they essentially saw their retirement money just up in smoke. I mean, you would, uh, quote unquote, understand uh, if something like like a crypto coin, like like Bitcoin, that it essentially lost uh, you know, 60% of its value. You understand ahead of time that what you're investing in, at least I hope so, if you do your due diligence, that you're investing in a very volatile asset. And it can, you know, if it uh, goes up, it essentially will quadruple, double, triple, what have you, it will hit the moon. Or uh, if it collapses, it's essentially you're at risk of losing all your own money. So uh, people will do their due diligence and invest, at least I hope so, um, they would invest a lot more prudently. Whether when people uh, invest in the traditional markets, I think because um, they've been told that, hey, this is all regulated, this is all overseen, and there's nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, that just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. That despite everything, and despite I would say the governments having our best interests at heart, we we still saw the erasure of millions of dollars and a lot of very salient money for a lot of people. So my thesis would essentially be is that uh, when people say that hey, crypto is essentially just it's all scams and it's just uh, ways of people depriving people of the money i would say it is not so and crypto is not dying it's essentially it's inextricably linked to traditional markets and because traditional markets are also um, hit very hard right now again by an artificial crisis artificial in the sense that uh, a lot of money got pumped into it money that was not naturally generated and because of that, now we're essentially feeling the burn of all that money being in the economy and not being able, and again, that money was not being able to be distributed in a traditional organic way where it was just funneled into specific ways that people could spend it on. Cool. cool. So we're going to get on to, I think we can probably get on some questions now from the audience if anyone wants to their hand up and come forward and ask any questions of either me or Boris. Or if you have your own opinion to share, you're also very yeah, welcome to do so. Make a point to everyone else. Do we have anyone out there? Don't be shy. Well, while we're waiting for um, some questions, maybe something that also to discuss uh, that's also relevant to all, all this happening, how, again, uh, the, the contrast between traditional finance of supposed regulations that are supposed that are there to protect people and pr protect the little guy, and how they essentially backfired. If I, uh, I think a lot of you would be aware of what happened with GameStop, where essentially a lot of um, hedge funds and a lot of institutional investors at the time, they uh, a company that's been down on its luck due to uh, some questionable uh, trading practices and on the other hand um, just uh, slightly older uh, and not contemporary sales model uh, the the stock has been beaten down pretty hard but it's also been beaten down hard because um, people are essentially short selling and short selling is when they essentially you predict that the, the stock is going to fall down and the lower it falls the more money you get on your bet and uh, people the hedge fund sold more stocks than they were actually realistically available. So what happened was is that when a lot of people who, uh, after all the cash injections happened and they started investing, they, they saw uh, that discrepancy and they started buying the stock. Naturally, that started it, it started an upward spiral and a positive feedback loop where the higher it rose because people who were short selling the stock they essentially lost the bet so they had to pay the winners the when they paid the winners they had to buy the stock because when you buy the stock it goes up uh it, the more it goes up the more of your 
short bets are losing. So you have to keep buying the stock and keep re um, repaying the people who are buying calls. And it got to a point where it the stock went from like eight dollars to, uh, if I'm mistaken, up to like four hundred fifty in the span of one month. So absolutely a meteoric rise. And because a lot of people were buying the stock on trading platforms at the time, like Robinhood or Trade Republic or many others or what have you at the time. So uh, to protect the people, uh, supposedly those uh, trading platforms have, have stopped the ability of people to buy the stock. They only allowed them to sell. But then the question is, if people are allowed to sell, then who do they sell to? Somebody should be able to buy it. And unfortunately, the, sell, the buyers of those sold stocks were institutional investors. So when you have people who, uh, so when you artificially restrict the ability of a stock to be bought by a majority of the people and only a certain element of people that can buy them, um, naturally, this created a big controversy of how the stock market is regulated. If I'm not mistaken, this um, actually the SEC Commission is still investigating it all if there was some malfeasance. Unfortunately, uh, to this day, we don't know uh, what exactly laws were broken, if any, but it did severely damage the uh, trust of uh, retail investors into uh, traditional. Was not traditional or uh, into buying platforms like Robinhood and many other, and so this just goes to show that a lot of the rules or a lot of the markets that people think are regulated to protect people are just as prone to failure as supposed crypto market. And regardless of where you invest or what you do, you always have to exercise your due diligence and always think: uh, Is the money you're investing money that you could potentially risk? And if the investment that you are choosing to commit your money to, if the risk that you're willing to take um, is calculated uh, according to your potential risk preference. Thanks for that, Boris. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't see any hands out there. Is anyone willing to come forward and give us a... Give us their two cents on what's happening at the moment in crypto and in TradFi. I'm sure we've got a lot of crypto fans out in the audience, so surely someone has an opinion on what they think is going on. I can't see anyone. What about you, Charlie? Uh, what, what is your subjective take on all of this? Where, where do we go from here and how? Uh, I think that, I think you touched on it earlier on, I think the fact that um, Bitcoin has dropped off so precipitously is not a huge surprise even though the the advocates and evangelists were saying it's a huge hedge against um inflation and things like that i think the fact is that it's now become so intertwined with the wider traditional economy and finance that people have it, it will be affected by macroeconomic events but i still think that long term especially bitcoin i think has got a I don't think it's going anywhere. And I think the thing we can see is that blockchain technology, if you go away from cryptocurrencies and finance and DeFi, I think blockchain technology is here to stay. There are still so many people and companies and platforms building so many different things. Um, you look at metaverse platforms, you look at the big traditional legacy companies that are buying into them. You look at gaming, as we touched on earlier. Um, all these people, it's like, I think um, I wrote an article about it a few few months ago. It's you. It's, it's almost like thinking that the blockchain and DeFi and gaming and play to earn stuff and Web3 is going to go away. It's kind of like saying the internet's going to go away. You can't turn the internet off and you can't turn off this technology. It's here to stay now. Um, who the winners will be in five to 10 years' time, um, they'll obviously come out in the wash. There's going to be a lot of losers. Um, but I think that this is a blip in. What the, and it's affected by what the world's going through at the moment, which is huge loads of external factors. There's conflict going on all over the world. There's oil prices which have gone up as a result of the war in Russia. Uh, sorry, in Ukraine. Um, there is um, issues, obviously, with the fact that we shut down our econ world economy for 18 months. Um, the fact that they put loads of false money into the system and are now trying to take it out by increasing interest rates. All these things. 
have accumulated to have the impact of recessions, drawbacks, uh, shrinkage in the economy. But I think that, well, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the long term. But this is almost, it was a kind of foreseeable economic shock that we're going through now. And I think that Bitcoin has just been one of the victims of it. But I do think it shows that this idea that uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, because they're decentralized, are a hedge against centralized power and um, uh, against inflation. I think that's kind of been shown to maybe not be quite the case. Um, but I'll be interested to see what the advocates and evangelists of, of Bitcoin will be saying in future. But I also think that it's shown you the strength of the of the space that we carrying on doing stuff. People are still interested in it. And it's not all just about money. It's about creating something new and fun. So yeah, there's my opinion on what I think is kind of happening at the moment and what, but who knows how long it's going to last or where it's going to go from here. But people are going to have to innovate and that's when the really interesting things come out because they've got the space. Yeah, essentially all, all the most interesting things happen in the recession because this is where we have to uh, yeah, push our creativity and our ability to the limit. And the other thing is there's not loads and loads of money swashing around in the system now. So people are going to have to think, how can we make stuff interesting without um, just having loads of cash to chuck at it? How can we make it interesting on a shoestring? Or how can we make it interesting that people aren't necessarily going to flock to it just because it's Web3? We have to make something that's actually a good product. I think you're going to see a lot yeah. of that now. I think in the next two years, you're going to see a lot of really interesting things come out and not just for PFP, NFT collections that people are trying to make a quick buck from. Yeah, they're going to, you know, what, what can we actually use NFT technology for? It's going to be interesting, not just how can we make the next board apes. Um, so I think it's exciting times, but it's obviously worrying. If people have lost a lot of money, that's obviously still a sad, sad thing for them because a lot of people are genuinely have lost a lot of money. If you look at just what happened with Terra, um, people have put in their, all their money, not knowing quite what a stable coin is and what the difference between different ones are. They would have chucked in loads of cash thinking, oh, look, don't worry, it's going to stay for a dollar. But um, obviously they found out that that's not the case. So it, as you've said quite a few times to talk already, Always do your due diligence. If you're not, if you don't understand a product, don't buy into it because there are always clever people out there who are finding out ways to get the money, and it could sometimes be your money. So yeah, be careful. Do your research. Use Dap Radar's tools to do it because we've got some of the best stuff out there. Um, yeah. And if that's not the truth, absolutely. Well, it seems we're doing for time. Um, I'd like to thank your participation, Charlie. Hopefully, we'll see a lot more of you on uh, the market movies in the future. I would like to uh, to thank everyone who came to this week's market movies, and we'll be here again same time next week. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating, and I wish you all a happy evening, morning, or the rest of the day, wherever you are. All the best. Thanks a lot, everyone.